My name is Cynthia Cruz, and I'm the executive partner at Evershed Sutherland. And I'm joined today by Cindy B.A., a partner with the firm, and Payam not pure, I have to ask you how to say that all the time, and um, as a counsel. Uh, we're going to talk today in our first Lunch and Learn series um, about uh, interval funds and closed-end funds. And so we're going to talk through some of the mechanics, um, how you do the distribution, the, um, the, whether you need multi-share um, class relief, and any distribution matters. Um, we've got a, a, a presentation for you um, today, and um, we're going to walk through that. And if you want copies of that, you can um, contact um, myself, Cindy, or, or Payam after, the, um, after our webinar. Anyway, and if you have any questions during the um, presentation, you can go down to the text box and type those in, and we'll try and address your questions as we're um, going through the, um, the, the, the slide deck and the webinar. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the closed-end funds um, to begin with. And closed-end funds start off, for the most part, um, when, as listed funds. Um, however, in the past couple of years, we've seen a lot more focus on what I would consider non-traditional um, closed-end funds, which are the non-traded, which were an outgrowth of the non-traded REITs and non-traded BDCs. Um, as a result of um, the market conditions, um, market demand, regulatory requirements, there's been a um, renewed interest um, in the, the non-traded closed-end funds and um, now interval funds. And so that's why we're addressing that today. So um, I'm going to walk through a couple questions on um, regulatory um, frameworks and that type of thing, and um, we're going to have um, Cindy focus on the closed-end fund piece and then move um, to interval funds, and Pime's going to lead us through that. So um, Cindy, can you give us some of the um, kind of description of the regulatory um, framework um, that closed-end funds, especially the non-traded, sure. operate in? Sure. And, and as you mentioned, we're, we're focusing here mostly on the non-traded closed-end funds as sort of a means of comparing them to interval funds. However, the, the general regulatory framework that applies to non-traded closed-end funds, you know, a, a lot of it also applies to, to listed closed-end funds. Um, so a, a closed-end fund, as defined under the you know, the Investment Company Act of 1940, is defined by the absence of not being an open-end fund. So the defining characteristic of a closed-end fund is simply just that it does not issue redeemable securities. Um, a, as a registered investment company, uh, a closed-end fund is exempt from substantive state regulation, which is, is an important fact. Uh, the, state may, you know, the state may not comment on your registration statement. A closed-end fund still does need to file notice filings, but they're not, um, they can't be provided, they don't get comments from the states. Um, in terms of the registration statement that a non-traded fund would offer its securities under, um, Rule 415 only allows the same registration statement to be used for a period of three years, um, and this is something that we'll contrast later with how, how interval funds operate. Um, and, and of course, uh, that during that three-year period, financial statements need to be kept up to date, and that can be done via a post-effective amendment filed under um, Form po um, POS 8C, which is subject to substantive SEC review, and generally, as a matter of practice, um, it must be declared effective by the SEC. Uh, so the issue is, is that an, an open-end fund has an unlimited number of securities that they can offer and redeem, and a closed-end has a specific number. And so to some extent, it's almost you've got some comparison between um, the non-traded closed-end is somewhat similar or more alike on an open-end fund, even though it's, you're using the closed-end fund um, regulatory framework. For, a, for a, an interval fund, right? The, the ability, as we'll discuss later, the ability to continue your registration statement without filing a new N2 is something very akin to what, uh, to what an open-end fund does. Um, and then just in terms of, you know, we know a number of our audience members are very familiar with business development companies or BDCs, and so to, to contrast the, the closed-end fund to the BDC space, they're, they're, it's, it's a different form. There are different forms that are filed. There are no, there's no 8Ks filed for a closed-end fund. The only real way to, to update information um, would be to file a prospectus supplement under 497, which is often referred to as a sticker. So you sticker the stickering your prospectus. An old term when you use paper. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Um, and then I guess turning to the, the next slide, just additional information about the regulatory framework. Um, and again, contrasting these points with the BDC, so there are a closed-end fund is subject to more stringent leverage limitations, 300%. Um, um, it, it is also not as able to charge an incentive fee. Um, it, it, the BDCs have a specific exemption to permit them to charge an incentive fee on capital gains, um, and the closed-end funds do not have that. Uh, there is also no ability to have blanket annual approval to, to sell shares below NAV. So they would have to do it on an um, individual transaction by transaction basis? Okay. Correct. So what are the um, reporting requirements? You mentioned the AK, but w um, what else do they have to file? Sure. So um, the uh, in the next couple of slides, we have mentioned the new form requirements that will come. Um, we've, we've included the compliance date on the slides. And just as a, a, a bit of background, um, there these may change. The um, in August, the last or I guess two months ago now, the ICI formally requested that the SEC delay the effectiveness date of these new form requirements, um, in no small part due to the the um, revelations that the uh, SEC has itself the Edgar system had been hacked. Um, so I guess this is a bit of a stay tuned as to to what will come. But before I a little bit of background on the current form requirements before we discuss the new forms. Um, the currently closed-end funds prepare annual and semi-annual reports that are sent to shareholders, and those are then filed with the SEC on form NCSR. And in quarters when they don't file the NCSR, they file um, information about portfolio holdings on a form NQ. And then two times per year, uh, closed-end funds have to file this form and NSAR, which is sort of census information. There's a lot of yes or no questions, a lot of fill in the blanks with numbers. And so those, the, the NQ and then the NSAR are the forms that are slotted to go away with the adoption of these new forms. So NPORT is a form that will replace NQ, um, but it is a monthly form um, that will be filed, at, you know, at the 30 days after the end of each month. And it is not going to be made public on a monthly basis, but only on a quarterly basis. And this is sort of where in a lot of um, the concern about the SEC's own cybersecurity lies, because a lot of this information is confidential and is, is meant to be kept confidential, and issuers don't want to be giving it to the SEC if the SEC can't protect it. Um, and then the other new form is the NSEN, which will replace the NSAR um, and will only be filed annually versus uh, semi-annually, and it, it too, it, it will have it will have different information than what the NSAR, but it's also generally a sort of a census type information, um, providing the SEC with information about what the fund is doing and how it operates. So really, the, the SEC here is taking advantage of the the, the speed of the, the digital technology as a result of requiring it on a monthly basis. A couple of years ago, you would have never thought that a, um, a, a fund could actually produce information that quickly. So they're they're going to have the information for a while. Um, it seems like to me that this is eventually going to be something that might be available more um, even with, on a monthly basis as opposed to quarterly. And the SEC seems like it's testing it out a bit. Um, but there, it, it's going to be a pretty fast pace on which information is going to be um, known. And that's certainly one of the concerns of funds, that, that ha getting up to speed and being able to compile all this information and put it in the form and submit it to the SEC on time. And th that's one main concern. And then also the concern of keeping confidential what information really needs to be kept confidential to you know, protect the investors of the fund. But consistent with the um, now the T plus 2, um, right, as opposed to the T plus um, 3, if that just was implemented, the SEC is definitely trying to take advantage of the availability of information. So what are the compliance requirements um, for a uh, closed-end fund? Sure. In general, Rule 38A1 applies. So just like any, um, any investment company that's regulated by the SEC, um, a closed-end fund has to have a, you know, a robust compliance program and have a, a CCO. Um, there are also general regulations you know, to protect investors that assets have to be held in, in custody pursuant to specific rules under the SEC. And then in addition to protect the assets of the fund, uh, a closed-end fund has to have a fidelity bond. And these are, you know, these are rules that apply to, you know, to all investment companies. Right. So this is standard across that, whether you're talking about any, uh, a mutual fund, sure. a listed closed-end fund, or non-traded. Um, and 
we'll um, talk about the interval in a minute, but it's, if you're going to be registered with the SEC or are basically offering public securities, you're, you're likely going to have to reach the same type of compliance. Correct. Correct. Right. Um, and then just a little information about the board. It's, it's the same. This is, again, um, the, the requirements for the board of the closed end fund are really no, no different than any regulated investment company. Um, the 40 Act itself only requires 40% independence, but there are a number of provisions and rules under under the Act that require that require you have a majority to be independent. Um, a number of exemptive rules. There's some there are some listed here on this slide. Um, perhaps one of the most common ones is the joint fidelity bond. Right, a, a number of um, a number of funds take advantage of that. And if you do, if you rely on the rule to have a joint fidelity bond, you have to have a majority independent. And just before we started, we were talking, we, we can't think of any um, funds that we're aware of that don't use right. a majority of the board. Right. So um, spending some time on the, um, basically getting your board together and, um, and your independence requirements when you first um, have someone join a board, but also as you go through it, you de definitely this is one of the, this is, they're the gatekeepers as far as the SEC is concerned, and they're the first line of defense um, when you're talking about compliance. Right, and I think you wouldn't want to be in a position to have to explain to the SEC why you didn't have a majority even if you're not technically required. Um, and so um, closed-in funds, the tax? Um, I mean, closed-in funds, again, like they can elect you know, pass-through taxation, which is obviously a beneficial um, tax structure and one of the reasons that, that people are interested in investment companies. We'll see where we end up on all that with the tax <laughs> legislation. Um, so one of the main areas is um, shareholder liquidity, especially if we're talking about the non-traded world. Um, what are the um, repurchase requirements for a closed-end fund? Sure. Um, for a, again, for obviously a, a listed closed-end fund doesn't have to address these issues because they offer liquidity via the by, just by being listed. Um, but a, a non-traded closed-end fund actually doesn't have any requirements, to, you know, technically about when it would offer to repurchase shares or how it does offer liquidity. That being said, you know, a model has developed that because. Obviously, shareholders don't necessarily want to get into a fund if there's no <laughs> no opportunity for liquidity, um, and so a model has developed that on its face actually looks a lot like the way interval funds operate, which is interesting. Um, but because they're not operating under the interval fund rule, they're subject to different regulations. Um, and so, historically, most non-traded closed-end funds have offered to repurchase their shares quarterly. Um, this is solely pursuant to, to board action. The board can, you know, there's no there's no required amount that needs to be repurchased. There's no required re required frequency of these repurchases, and the board can terminate it at any time. Um, and, and this is done, you know, pursuant to a a, a, stand, a standard tender offer. Right. And a standard tender offer means the tender offer forms, so you're filing with the SEC, keeping it open for the particular number of days, 20 days. So it's it's a, a pr pretty. Um, Standardized process, but it's um, fairly intensive. It's a lengthy document that must be filed. Correct. So yeah. all the the um, information you hear about um, the repurchase programs is really a market driven um, issue. Meaning, if you're going to do the same size repurchase as you do your drip, all of that type of thing is really dictated by kind of where um, the underwriters have um, or, or the market has shifted. Yeah, the selling firm, the who will sell your product based on what you're offering. Correct. So, so looking at the most recent versions of whatever um, is at the SEC or whatever is being approved is one of the ways of making sure you've got the standard um, process and, and numbers and amounts for the repurchase program. So what are some of the other um, issues around underwriting um, and compensation for a closed-end fund? Sure, and, and this is, is this is one area where it's a very big distinction between a, not, a standard non-traded closed-end fund and an interval fund. Um, a standard non-traded closed-end fund is subject to substantive FINRA review, meaning you must file your registration statement with FINRA, um, and they have to they can provide comments, and you also need to request a no objection letter before commencing sales. And so this obviously adds additional cost and time to, to the offering. Um, so it's definitely this process is is viewed as a, a negative. Um, the uh, FINRA regulates non-traded closed-end funds under Rule 5110, and while there is no, as you know, there is no explicit cap on underwriting comp, FINRA has generally said that 8% is is it, um, and they have, and that contrasts with, um, you know, with the non-traded BDCs and REITs, which are at 10%. So this is a 
a lower a lower cap and also FINRA has taken the position that, that due diligence expenses need to be included in that cap too. So, so and, um, this is obviously a, 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 a retail product right. um, and one of the, um, so as a result the FINRA process is, is fairly extensive especially when you're talking about um, not only the FINRA, um, your perspective, but also your advertising needs to go through um, the FINRA review process. So it's, a, it's, it's very similar to the SEC process, meaning in length of time, if not a little bit longer, um, when you're talking about these types of products. Sure, it can be, especially if you're trying to do something different that they haven't, right, if you have something they haven't seen before. So it, it definitely can add time and expense to the process. Right. And with the changes as a result of the um, the, um, the new um, DOL rules and things like that, there's been some movement around compensation and so there's been a variety of things that have been um, going through FINRA that, and, and as you said, they take a little bit longer, but it's, it's, it's um, they certainly, um, you will, you'll spend time on it is, is really the, the point where and sometimes sure. when you're going through a, just an underwritten offering, you wouldn't see that. Right. So now we're going to um, shift over to interval funds and um, try and um, compare and contrast a little bit, um, so we're going to. Um, Time's going to um, join us for that discussion, and um, both myself and Cindy will be asking him questions just to give him a, a little bit of a hard time. But and the reason we decided to talk about um, interval funds uh, is because we have seen quite a bit of activity uh, recently. Uh, there's currently 56 active interval funds um, with about 3.9 billion in assets, um, and I would bet that that has actually been raised in the last um, two or three years. Um, because you really couldn't find very many active interval funds prior to that. Um, the interval funds, um, the, the composition of the portfolio or the investment strategies is uh, fairly, um, fairly broad. It's, um, you know, real estate, um, middle market loans, which is newer to the um, structure. Um, and, um, and then also you have um, listed and, and, um, and non-listed investments. So when you break it down, you can see at the bottom of the slide the various areas most of it is still in, um, in real estate, but uh, I do think that as you see um, more managers who have done debt or credit, you may see more um, that it look a little bit like um, the BDCs in some situations. So, um, Pine, can you maybe walk us through what the requirements for an interval fund, which I bet um, before today a lot of people hadn't heard much about? Sure. So uh, the interval fund is a registered closed-end fund. So a lot of the requirements, if not most of the requirements that Cindy alluded to, will also apply to an interval fund. So the limitations on leverage, the limitations on the types of incentive fees that an advisor can charge, the ability to sell below NAV, all those would apply equally to an interval fund. Uh, likewise with the forms that Cindy uh, alluded to, the same process, including the new forms, will all apply to interval funds. But where interval funds are different is that they're governed specifically by Rule 23C3, which in an interval fund effectively has to comply with in order to get the benefits that we'll discuss in, this, in these uh, slides. Great. So um, effectively, they, they, because they're a subset of um, a closed-end fund similar to a BDC, the same type of um, rules that we were just talking about really do kind of cross over. Um, it's, it's a covered security, the um, registration um, requirements or the effectiveness that we talked about as well as the FIN review really do apply here with some tweaks which we'll go through. Right, right. And, and the rules relating to the public offerings of interval funds is really where we start to see some significant differences between the traditional closed-end funds that Cindy discussed and interval funds. So like Cynthia just mentioned, they're still uh, not subject to state review just as traditional non-traded BDCs are. But hey, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, non-traded closed-end funds. But uh, one big distinction, Cindy uh, referred to the limitation of three years for a uh, traditional closed-end funds registration statement. Interval funds do not have that limitation. So an interval fund can file its registration statement and assuming certain conditions are satisfied, that registration statement can be used uh, effectively for the life of the interval funds offering regardless of how long it goes. Um, as it relates to the post-effective amendment process, like Cindy mentioned, uh, when you have a registration statement, you do have to update it with financials or other material events that occur. With the traditional non-traded closed-end funds, when you file a post-effective amendment, that post-effective amendment is subject to SEC review. In the case of an interval fund, if you're uh, updating the registration statement, for example, to update the financial statements, 
that registration statement is effective immediately upon filing without any SEC review. Now, there are some types of post-effective amendments that are more material, but even in those cases, you have an automatic effectiveness such that you file the registration statement, the SEC can review it, but you will be declared effective within 60 days. So you have a lot more predictability in terms of the effectiveness of your registration statement. And finally, and uh, Cindy referred to this as well, maybe most significantly as it relates to FINRA, uh, interval funds do not have to file their registration statements or otherwise have their offering terms and compensation uh, terms to uh, brokers uh, cleared by FINRA. So as soon as you're declared effective by the SEC, you do not need to get FINRA clearance. You can just simply start selling your shares as an interval fund. So um, really this kind of eliminates some of the issues that we saw a couple of years ago with some of the non-traded BDCs where there were some issues that arose with the um, N2s and, there, um, and it, people were having to grapple with whether they were going to have to stop selling or how they sell through that um, and then get effective. If you've got automatic effectiveness, you have more certainty around that. Certainly the SEC could still um, ask you to maybe potentially withdraw and refile or something if there was a big issue, but you definitely have a lot more certainty around these, um, these registration statements than we've seen in the past in some of the, um, the BDC structures. Right, especially if you have nothing material changing and you're just updating your financials as all funds have to do, then you're just effective immediately. So um, one of the areas I think that people would want to focus on is the, um, how do you determine the price? So we don't have a market. We're not listed. Um, uh, most interval funds, um, they're required to uh, be uh, priced uh, or an NAV is determined weekly. Is that the requirement? That, that's right. So uh, Rule 23C3 um, requires an interval fund at a minimum to declare NAV on a weekly basis. Um, now, if you're offering your shares on a daily basis or continuously, the rule requires that you strike NAV uh, every day. Um, so again, it's a minimum of weekly, and if you're offering, it's daily. And also, as it relates to your repurchase offers as an interval fund, which we'll get into, you also have to declare NAV the five business days, uh, every day for the five business days before a repurchase request deadline. So in that sense, they're significantly different than a traditional closed-end fund, which, Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I guess you really strike NAV is it twice a year when you're filing your annual and semi-annual I mean, unless you're selling. Well, it, also if you're purchasing, that has to be done at NAV too. Right, but generally it's far less frequent than weekly or, or even in daily. So that's a significant difference. Right, So, um, but if we're talking, um, I mentioned that the portfolios may be um, uh, just a, a debt portfolio somewhat similar to a, a BDC or other credit fund. How do you do that daily? Well, that is one of the challenges that interval funds have. But basically what interval funds do is it's not that your board will get together as, say, with a BDC, you get your board together quarterly to uh, declare the fair value or declare NAV. Um, interval funds will adopt policies and procedures related to their valuation that effectively, um, for lack of a better term, delegates. You don't, the board doesn't really delegate the responsibility to strike fair value, but it allows the management of the uh, interval fund pursuant to the policies and procedures adopted by the board to strike NAV. This is obviously a lot easier when you have a liquid portfolio if there's a market price, but to the extent you have illiquid assets that require uh, kind of a fair value determination, you just have to make sure your policies and procedures allow for a daily strike of fair value um, and, and to be able to take account for any material events that occur on a daily basis. And, and you know, in this instance, I think interval funds are learning a lot from mutual funds because mutual funds have been down this path, whereas you know, most mutual funds do have highly liquid portfolios. They are permitted to have up to 15% in illiquid securities, and even all of those still need to be valued on a daily basis. So most mutual funds have developed very robust policies about how to handle the daily valuation of these you know, less liquid assets. Um, and I think interval funds are you know, taking some cues from them. Right, but but it's um it's something it's something definitely you have to um, manage for yes. um, and build your port, uh, your platform out so that you can handle um, daily um, pricing. Um, but I agree, you certainly could look to the um, the other mutual funds um, or their policies and procedures. It's just a um, a, a, a lot more work. Um, and, <laughs> if and you're the key be is going to be to make sure that you have not only robust policies and procedures, but that you're actually following them, which obviously the SEC would be very focused on if they were able to look at your valuation practices. Right. So I'm going to um, answer a question that we were just asked um, because it's a, we just passed 
uh, over that topic, um, and we're glad to get questions. <laughs> it's um, is the FINRA precluded from substantive review, or have they just not imposed the requirement for interval funds? The interval funds are just not governed under 5110. They're governed under, of, under Rule 2341, which we'll you know get to later. So there's no because it's a different it's a different it's a completely different structure. Right? More like mutual funds. It is the mutual fund sales charge rule, correct? Right. So a mutual fund doesn't go through a pre-approval like um, what we're talking about as, as far as reviewing from a substantive standpoint. Right. You don't file anything. With FINRA. I mean, you advertising materials are certainly filed with FINRA, but you do not file your offering documents with FINRA for a mutual fund or an interval fund. Right. And, and this is a well-established position. FINRA actually put out a notice that said, effectively, because interval funds are distributed in a manner similar to mutual funds, uh, they are exempt from FINRA filing and review. Uh, provided that uh, they, they are governed by uh, the same rules that apply to mutual funds, in this case it's Rule 2341. Uh, so it is a uh, established FINRA position that they will not review the offerings of the uh, interval fund. So, um, I do think that this is something that FINRA continues to look at, just like they look at all the products that are coming through, and they're looking at compensation, and whether they'll ever um, look at this in a different light, it's you know uncertain, but that's the, the, the current status. It's, it's just it's not required, it's in a completely different um, area. So um, going on to the um, reporting requirement. Right, so the reporting requirements, again, are exactly the same as the traditional close end funds that Cindy referred to, the annual reports, the semi-annual reports, uh, and they will also likewise be subject to the same forms uh, once they become effective. And similarly, unlike uh, uh, those of you listening who are familiar with the BDC structure, with the 8K requirements for any material events, uh, interval funds, like the traditional closed end funds, also do not have that requirement, but obviously you would sticker uh, your prospectus in the event something material happened. So um, are they RICs? They are RICs. They, are, they can be taxed as RICs, assuming they meet all the same uh, requirements of distribution and diversification. So explain to us a little bit more um, detail about um, the shareholder um, liquidity. Um, and, and basically uh, how that's established. Sure. So like Cindy said, with uh, traditional non-traded uh, closed-end funds, there's really no requirement that any liquidity be offered to shareholders. It's largely a marketing-driven point where shareholders are going to demand some liquidity, and so non-traded closed-end funds like the non-traded BDCs that we represent established effectively a quarterly repurchase program through tender offers. Now that is, of course, completely discretionary, um, and so the board can shut that off pretty much whenever it wants. And this is where interval funds differ significantly from your traditional non-traded closed-end fund. An interval fund under Rule 23C3 must adopt a fundamental policy pursuant to which it pre-establishes the frequency at which it will repurchase, offer to repurchase shares, and also uh, mandates how much must be um, offered. To, to be repurchased. So an interval fund has to declare at outset that it will either offer to repurchase shares uh, every three months, every uh, six months, or once a year. So effectively, you choose between quarterly, semi-annually, and annual repurchase offers. And every repurchase offer that you make has to be between a minimum of 5% uh, of the outstanding shares and a maximum of 25% of the outstanding shares. And the reason there is obviously uh, to make every repurchase request meaningful. So, so let's just um, spend a, a minute on that. It's a fundamental policy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a fundamental policy means that you've got to have shareholder approval to change it. To change it, correct. So you are committing um, in your your um, prospectus or your um, disclosure document that you are going to to make this. So it's a, it's almost like a. Um, preferred return or something along those lines is because it's, it's, it's something you're definitely going to do except, and we'll get into the exceptions, but. Right, I mean, and that's, so when you establish your fundamental policy, you really need to give a lot of thought and make sure it is something that your investment strategy will make possible because obviously you'll have to get shareholder approval if you ever want to change it, which can be quite onerous. Um, and, and the frequency is pretty rigid. Even offering more liquidity um, is a problem, so the, the rules, uh, only allow you one additional discretionary repurchase offer in any two-year period, um, which seems counterintuitive because you would think it'd be shareholder friendly to offer more liquidity. But once you set that interval, call it twice a year, and you want to do one more, you cannot rely on the same 
uh, forms under Rule 23C3, but for once every two years to make that repurchase offer. And so are you using the same type of um, forms that you would for a, um, for an other closed end fund, the, the, the Schedule TO and that type of thing, or is it um, is it is it more uh, an easier filing? Uh, it's an easier filing. It's called a form N twenty three C three. It's a lot of the you know similar information that you would see in a Schedule TO in terms of you describe the terms of the repurchase offer and other disclosures about the uh, company. Uh, but the disclosure requirements are a little bit less onerous. Uh, just very high level. You know, if a form twenty uh, N twenty three C three comes out to maybe 15 or 20 pages worth of documentation that you file and, and distribute to uh, shareholders. Tender offer materials are probably looking you know, maybe 40 pages worth of materials. So it, similar disclosures, but slightly less onerous under the form N23C3. Right, so um, let's just um, pause on this again, because obviously um, nobody wants to get into a, a fund they can't get out of. So um, now that we know that there's a fundamental requirement, or you, you're going to, you know, you're going to have to basically provide that liquidity um, uh, during those periods of time. Um, what are some of the other requirements under the rule? As it relates to the, we got liquid assets. Oh, sure. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, the rule allows you to. It doesn't specify that integral funds have to have a particular type of investment strategy. So in theory, you can be an integral fund and invest in pretty much whatever you want. Having said that, you really need to be mindful of your of the liquidity of your portfolio because when you make a repurchase request uh, or repurchase offer, the rule requires that you have sufficient liquid assets to satisfy the full amount of that repurchase offer. So if you put out an offer for 5%, uh, for a certain amount of time before the deadline ends, your portfolio must consist of enough cash or enough liquid securities that if everyone that you offered wanted to repurchase, you'd be able to have the money on hand uh, to be able to make that repurchase request. So there's flexibility in your investment strategy, but there are also limitations under Rule 23C3 that mandate what kind of uh, liquid assets you have to have on hand. So um, again, the liquid assets definition, you have to be, the, the liquid assets refers to anything that can be sold or disposed of in the ordinary course of business, pretty wide open, um, and at approximately the price of what the company has valued the um, investment. That's right. So does that limit the um, interval funds um, portfolios or investments they can make? It, it doesn't, I guess it does and it doesn't. Um, you know, you can again, invest in anything that you want, but you want to make sure your portfolio manager is very mindful of what he or she is investing in. Um, if you're a direct origination platform and all your assets are typically your investments are in private loans and you want to launch an interval fund, that's fine, but you just need to make sure that based on the type of frequency that you elect, your fundamental policy, that you invest in enough liquid assets to cover that. And really that desire for flexibility is where a structure that kind of has a hybrid between the interval fund and the traditional closed end fund with their discretionary tenders might be of interest to folks in terms of um, the frequency that they uh, choose as a fundamental policy for repurchases. So if, you're doing, if you want to do um, debt and you want to do basically some negotiated deals and some broadly syndicated, you could, prob you could basically manage to that. Um, but you would definitely need to have something that you could dispose of quickly because you have to um, basically have 100% of the repurchase offer amount, right? And then you only have seven days to basically make the, um, the, the repurchase. Right. Unlike, for example, just to compare it to a tender, which is 20 days, and there's obviously you can finance um, and do different right. things. But um, uh, this is a very specific requirement to make sure, again, the, the, the money's there. Right. Right. And if you're still in your offering period, you can use cash inflows to, to manage the redemption process, too. So there's different, I mean, it's, it's going to be a fund specific determination based on what, what's coming in and, and what they're holding. And there is some, um, SC, there's an SEC proposal out there about a liquidity um, policy. So there may be some more um, focus on that. It was a, um, it was a proposal or uh, interpretive guidance. That right, that, is for, that, that only applies to mutual funds, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling that at some point they're going to uh, apply it to everyone. <laughs> um, so when you're looking at this, what if somebody wanted to do um, just, um, if they wanted to invest in, in um, a, a, and this is a question that was asked, um, they wanted to invest in just private funds. 
um, through a, either a closed-in fund or an interval fund. Does that work? Um, well, probably not because <laughs> because of the SEC's position that you can't have more than 15% of your assets in a in a private fund. Yeah, um, which is a separate issue other than from an interval fund. It, it's a a sort of a long-standing position that the SEC has held. Yeah, and to the extent uh, uh, the person that asked the question is is wondering how there are existing funds that invest more than 15% in private funds, uh, that was a rather lengthy and significant conversation we had with the SEC. I guess somehow uh, some folks got through with that, but the official position now is that everyone is limited to 15%. Again, some funds may be grandfathered in that sense, but. Uh, they've made it very clear that no new uh, registered funds are going to get through if the investment strategy is to invest more than 15%, and you, you will be limited to the 15% of your assets and in investments in private funds. Right. And when we're talking about private funds, we're talking about C1 or C7. We're really not. Even if a, a CLO would, would fall in that, the CLO is, um, is, is um, distinguished yes. um, for this purpose. Right. Um, and real estate funds are fine as well. Right. So what... Um, what if you did have um, basically a portfolio? Um, how would you, uh, of a private fund, meaning a real estate or a CLO, how would you value those? Um, someone's asking about how would you value them on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I don't. I think people are coming up with solutions using third-party valuation firms is something that I think a lot of uh, funds feel the need to turn to because your board is going to want some support that the valuation decisions were were made. You know, we're given a lot of thought to. Um, so, I mean, obviously, the, the more complicated the asset, the more difficult valuation becomes, and probably the more expensive the whole valuation process will become overall. So, um, and this is a question. Um, this is just since we're talking about this again, is do we do we think that the daily pricing is going to be something that um, effectively the market requires because of the fact that retirement accounts are getting into the, the um, this class of securities? I mean, I think as far as, as we know right now, the the all the interval funds that are out there do do daily NAV because they're doing daily sales. Daily sales. Yeah. Um, and so, if you want to be able to right, if you're, and this really has to do with what channels the, these are being offered on, um, and how they're sold. They're often sold in the same way that mutual funds are sold, which means that the selling firms want to be able to put in orders every day and not have to to you know have a different time frame pursuant which to their entering orders. And I would think I would assume the same is it'd, it'd be the same thing in the retirement space market, right? That you want to put the money in every day. If you're going to be offered in a channel that typically has offered mutual funds, you're going to need to be selling every day. Yeah, so I guess by default then they would have to strike an AV every day because you're going to want to sell as often as you can, I would imagine. So it looks like that's um, where we're going if we're not already there. Yeah. And the we're, we're there and we don't know if other people are going to try different models, yeah. but Right now, I think the everyone, or most everyone, is doing daily. And um, and just to, I think we might have um, skipped over this point is that um, even though we keep talking about NAV as the pricing, t technically you can't sell below NAV, but um, a closed end fund or you know, an interval fund potentially could could sell a, a stock above NAV. Um, usually, we're using NAV as the pricing because that's the mechanism that's used here. But similar to other products. This could be you could have a you could actually be um, pricing it above that amount. Well, non-traded closed-end funds are often sold you know above NAV, and but interval funds, you know, mutual funds are required to sell at NAV, and interval funds you know, usually comply with that and, and are selling at NAV. So. And, and repurchase offers, I don't think we mentioned it, have to be at NAV, so you can't you know repurchase at a discount either. So, Pam, you. Um, there, we've been talking about the fundamental policy, what you have to do, what you're required to do. Can you maybe explain a, um, a little bit of different approach on some of this repurchase um, um, area? Sure. So um, obviously there's a lot of benefits to being an interval fund from a regulatory standpoint, but there is you know, a fair amount of responsibility there with the uh, mandatory repurchase offers. And generally speaking, offering more liquidity to shareholders is, from a marketing standpoint, desired. So. Most interval funds will um, elect the kind of maximum number of repurchases, which is uh, the quarterly repurchases. Um, to kind of solve for this problem of maintaining enough liquidity but also having a flexible investment strategy, uh, we had clients approach us about a possibility of having a hybrid approach. So we looked into this and reached out to the SEC 
and effectively got them comfortable with the idea that you can combine a interval fund a repurchase offer with the uh, tender offer process that uh, Cindy described for traditional uh, non-traded BDCs. And effectively, what you would do is that you would uh, adopt your fundamental policy under the interval, interval fund rules and pick any interval that you want. But then on top of that, you would supplement uh, on a discretionary basis with tender offers. So you would effectively be using just two different types of forms, whether it's a form N23C3, the interval fund uses, but then you could supplement with tender offer materials. And you could take that really as far as you wanted to. In theory, well, not in theory, and in fact, you can be an interval fund, get all the same benefits as all other interval funds, even if you take one mandatory repurchase a year, but then you can kind of um, say that you'll do your best or you intend to supplement that with three additional tender offers. And again, you can't do that as an interval fund only because you're limited to the one discretionary interval fund repurchase in any two-year period. So that hybrid approach could be an interesting way to kind of have less of a required repurchase requirement, but then the ability to offer just as much liquidity to shareholders. So, so really this type of approach, um, one gives us a little bit different view of the regulations and, and what's required, so it gives some flexibility, but it also allows managers maybe to look at um, a different composition of their investment portfolio because of the, the requirement on what they're committing to pay out. Right, exactly. And, and from, you know, again, you don't want to tell shareholders you want to limit their liquidity, but, you know, if you have a great investment opportunity where that money from a shareholder or best interest standpoint really would be better spent in this interesting investment opportunity, you could say, well, look, you know, we, we're going to do one mandatory a year, but on a discretionary basis we'll do more. But if something better comes along than a repurchase offer, then you have that flexibility without kind of blowing up your interval fund status. And, and you, I mean, you'd have to do some um, work to get the market to accept um, these types of, of, of these differences in a program, right? Because we've talked about the market dictates a lot of these terms. Exactly. Now that's the question. If you can get investors comfortable that you know, say again, your your one mandatory repurchase offer, you know, uh, in combination with kind of a best efforts promise to do you know three or four more a year, if that's uh, palatable to investors. So. So um, we've actually gotten a question on whether um, there is really an interval fund as an actual defined term, or is it really just a closed-end fund with a um, with a periodic liquidity? Um, the term interval fund is is not used in, in the 40 Act, right? Any a fund that has elected to adopt a fundamental policy pursuant to Rule 23C3 has been referred to as interval fund. I guess for the reason that you are the fundamental policy selects the interval at which you repurchase your shares. But that is not a term in the 40 Act. So, so the, I guess the question is, um, if we're um, going along with the new approach, is, uh, it would still be a interval fund from a market standpoint because you are you have a fundamental policy, but you've got the discretionary piece as well. Right, and, and more importantly, you're an interval fund from the standpoint of the SEC rules that apply to you that we talked about with like you know the registration statement being good. Uh, indefinitely, the automatic effectiveness of your self-registration statement, and perhaps most significantly, uh, the way FIN reviews you um, without the substance of FIN review. So, um, so you took us right into um, our next area, which is um, what are the underwriting compensation requirements? We talked a little bit, but maybe you can t take us through this a little more slowly. Sure. Right, and and so the again, this is Rule 2341, and I think I probably said earlier that Rule 23 20. 341 specifically mentions interval funds. Right. What it specifically mentions is any closed-end company that makes periodic repurchase offers pursuant to Rule 23C3. So that's it, there's no term interval fund. It, it always is going to refer you back to that rule. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, um, because interval funds are not subject to substantive FIN review. They're not governed by 5110. Uh, 5110 um, and they um, they do not need a no objections offering to sell their shares. Um, so we keep we say they're governed by 2341. And so what that is is it's the mutual fund sales charge rule, um, and it really limits the the sell, selling compensation. Um, so the front end loads for an interval fund. And again, this is the same rule that applies to mutual funds. The front end loads are are limited um, to a max of eight and a half percent 
Um, and that gets that amount of eight and a half percent gets lowered depending upon other charges that the fund may have. Um, so if the fund has eight and a half percent, it could not have um, a 12B1 fee, which is an asset-based distribution fee. Um, and down to 6.25 percent again, depending upon other charges. Um, so I mentioned a, a 12B1 type fee, which is again a fee that a mutual fund typically charges. That interval funds have started to charge these types of fees. Um, and again, not to jump ahead, but as we'll mention later, a lot of interval funds are operating as multi-class funds because many of them have received multi-class relief. And you know, we're saying that they're governed by 2341, which is a, a is a mutual fund rule. By getting multi-class relief, a number of these funds have already also agreed to be, to subject themselves to additional mutual fund rules. And so this concept of a distribution fee and a service fee, this comes entirely from the, the mutual fund space. Um, and the and you do see interval funds charging these asset-based distribution fees and asset-based um, asset based service fees. And there's, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of movement in this area as far as how people are charging fees in different structures, somewhat because of the new FINRA rules, but also because of the DOL rules right. or anticipation of them. Um, I don't know that there's been a, um, a kind of a market standard on some of that, but um, you're seeing a lot more trail or, or service sure. fees of, of that nature. And then again, I think the mutual fund space is really leading this just because it's so much bigger. Um, but even in the mutual fund space, I think given the uncertainty with what's going to exactly happen with the DOL rule, there has not, there was a huge push for a, a T share in the mutual fund space, which is, and there's a similar structure in the interval fund space too, with a, a smaller load and a, a, a trail commission. Um, and everyone registered for those shares, and not many people are offering them now because now it turns out that the selling firms don't want them. So I think a lot of this really is dictated by what the selling firms want to have on their platform. Um, and another question we got, um, uh, uh, Cindy, is just um, do you have to, does FINRA need to review um, broker dealer distributor information if it's just going to the broker dealer and not going out to the um, ultimate um, investor? Um, the sale, you mean marketing sale, materials? Yes, marketing materials. I mean, no, there's. If you look at the the FINRA rule, that does technically not need to be filed with with FINRA, although in some state cases it, it is often filed. But um, you want to be careful about something right. like that. It can always leak <laughs> out. <laughs> um, right. And but FINRA also the 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 process for filing it. There, you don't always need to file it necessarily be, before it's it's used. There's a there's a delayed review process too. So it's a, the 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 rules are are complicated. Right. I think most interval funds do have their marketing pieces yeah. going out to investors. They have to have those reviews. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So anything that's going to the, the guiding point should be anything that's going to hit, hit um, the ultimate sh um, investor. You definitely need review. If there's something that you're going to be keeping in house with one of the independent broker dealer firms, something along those lines, you may not need to. Um, and it goes to your risk analysis there. Right. So let's go on to the offering um, process. And um, Pine, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that. Some of this reiterates some of the points we've been talking through. Yeah, we, we talked about the continuous offering of uh, shares, um, uh, the requirement to strike NAV on a daily basis, the fact that you have a registration statement that does not have a three-year life, and the more efficient manner in which you can update by post-effective amendment your registration statement. Um, but really the benefit of interval funds is that stems from the view which has got them uh, got them the thinner exemption is that they are uh, similar to mutual funds, again, even though they are technically closed-end funds. And it's that view that has allowed uh, greater flexibility on the part of um, uh, distribution platforms to allow interval funds uh, onto their uh, selling platform. And the benefit of that is that you have a much more efficient distribution method. Uh, these large platforms that sell mutual funds, they use a system uh, referred to in the industry as point and click, which is significantly easier um, than that, say, that non-traded BDCs, the process they have to sell shares. Uh, those of you who have non-traded BDCs, you know that in order for any investor to buy a share of a non-traded BDC, they have to complete a long paper subscription agreement. In the case of an interval fund on a distribution platform of a big broker, it's just a couple clicks on your computer and you can sign up uh, for the uh, to, to buy shares of an interval fund. And for reasons that I'm not entirely clear as to why it is that with an interval fund, these platforms have demonstrated a greater willingness to put them on their platforms as opposed to a uh, 
traditional traded closed end fund. I don't know, but I don't think there's anything preventing a traded uh, traditional closed end fund from using the point and click platform. But again, for whatever reason, uh, interval funds seems to be looked upon more favorably than your traditional closed end fund. So, um, what are some of the other? Um, we, we talked about the distribution method. Um, anything else? Any other considerations you've got when you're looking at the interval fund structure? So the considerations are uh, really what we've discussed in terms of the various requirements, specifically as it relates to the frequency of NAV determination. Um, you're going to have a fairly heavy administrative role to play as a manager of an interval fund. So that's just something to keep track of. You know, you've got the daily valuation. If you're doing daily NAV, you need to make sure that your investment strategy is consistent with your ability to offer repurchase requests. So there is a fair bit of monitoring to do. Uh, from a kind of a back office standpoint, so that is certainly something to be aware of before launching an interval fund. Anything else you want to mention about the liquidity that we haven't already gone through or um, how you want to manage that, the composition? I think we've talked a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, I, again, it's just really up to the portfolio manager to make sure that whatever strategy that he or she wants to employ um, will allow for the necessary liquidity and to kind of balance the the desire to give shareholders liquidity, perhaps with that hybrid uh, process that we just uh, described, to not limit what you're investing in, but also uh, be able to provide meaningful liquidity to your uh, to your shareholders. And of course, marketing consideration, you know, the, what you can market, what people will buy, will, will largely drive that. And then um, just maybe um, quickly, because we're um, running up against time, is, uh, is there a, the ability to have multi-class relief um, for uh, interval funds? Yes. Uh, so, you know, for reasons that we, I certainly don't understand, um, interval funds and I guess registered closed end funds uh, routinely and rather easily get multi class relief. Um, and that's obviously a sore spot for our friends with non traded BDCs. We're still waiting on that. But an interval fund uh, on a very routine basis can get multi class relief. And really, with uh, where that comes in handy is with the share structure, the fee structures that Cindy described. Um, you as an interval fund, once you get multi-class relief, you can offer as many different share classes as you want and you can have any combination of the fee structures uh, that Cindy alluded to. So you can have a share class that only charges a front-end load and you can charge up to 8.5%. You can have a share class that uh, has an upfront load, but then also a distribution fee on a trail basis and that reduces your total 85 down to I think 7.5%. Uh, but you can play around with any combination of that fee structure with a front end, a distribution fee, and a service fee, and offer any number of those class share combinations with multi-class relief, which again is really just a few months away uh, upon filing. Right. And, and just to be clear, most of these exemptive orders, they apply to interval funds, and they also specifically will apply to any closed end funds that make periodic purchase offers pursuant to the tender offer process. So this is one instance where non-traded closed end funds and interval funds are actually treated similarly, and non-traded BDCs are excluded. So we're going to um, bring our um, discussion to a close. And when, um, we got a lot of questions today. So if we, we didn't address your question and, and you'd like us to, you certainly can um, email any one of us and we can talk you through that. One of the questions um, that came up um, that I wanted to talk about was just, why would you choose um, an interval fund over, for example, a, mul uh, a mutual fund um, or uh, pot potentially an ETF? Is, as a to to offer, I mean, yeah. The, yeah. Well, I mean, the big issue is the um, the the management of a a mutual fund requires you to offer daily redemptions, right? So you have to be able to to manage. First of all, they're limited to fifteen percent liquidity. Um, they're also subject to the new liquidity risk management rule that the SEC adopted, which will be an, an additional sort of onerous compliance process. Um, but I, I think there are certain they're, su they're subject to 15% illiquid only, so you're really limited in what illiquid assets that you can invest in. You also need to be able to meet daily redemption requests that are in no way limited by you, right? You can you could have a daily redemption request for half of your portfolio, um, and you have to be able to meet that. The um, non-traded closed-end fund and an interval fund allows the manager to much better manage um, the redemption, right? That they're they're only offering liquidity on a limited basis, so they don't have to be prepared. They don't have to be prepared to redeem their shares daily. 
So, and, and this, um, I asked that question because this really does lead to our last point in our conclusion, which is, you know, when you're looking at different types of fund structures, you really do need to compare and contrast and look at, you know, what is your um, investment strategy, um, what kind of um, shareholder liquidity do you want to offer, uh, what kind of distribution model are you looking at or do you have, and then, of course, the operational administrative requirements and the cost. Um, around those, and that's what you. What we would suggest is that uh, effectively you need to look at all the different variety of funds and see which um, which one would be most appropriate for you as a manager. And you may need all uh, various um, uh, products, meaning uh, um, uh, interval fund, a BDC, an ETF. You could have a full plan of play, and we are obviously seeing a lot of people taking advantage of various products for different reasons. So um, we do um, think that we'll be coming back to you with um, some other Lunch and Learn sessions. Um, if you would like a copy of the slide presentation that we've gone through today, email one of the, um, the presenters, myself, Cindy, or Arpayam. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.